Okay, go ahead, Erin. Hi, everybody. This is a difficult topic this morning because um, I know our panel is the psychological effects on people during the COVID-19 quarantine, basically. And um, I just, uh, this morning, had a call from a friend in France who I go every month, every, every year to do a week-long seminar with their center. And uh, he and his partner, his girlfriend, um, his sort of wife, she, they both have COVID. I just found this out yesterday. And so I'm just a bit in shock. And um, he didn't look very good when we were on Skype. And I asked him if he was, he said, I don't feel very well. And I went, oh, no. Because, you know, it's one thing to have a cold and another thing to have COVID. So I, I got that news this morning. And um, that sort of affects my, uh, the personal touch for me. And I think we've all got in some way some important personal c connections that have been made through this, di this uh, sort of dire situation. And I mean, it was at the end of December of 2019 when I was looking at the ephemeris at the Saturn-Pluto conjunction, which became exact on January 13th. And that really disgusted me with, um, discussed with me um, the idea of a global depression, which made sense until we got into March on March the 8th. And I'd, been, I'd marked it in my ephemeris March the 8th with Sun exactly conjunct Neptune and Venus exactly conjunct Uranus within minutes of each other on March the 8th. And that's when it was announced, COVID. Um, for what it was, that it was a, you know, a flamboyant disease that was catchable. And Saturn, when it enters Aquarius, it, you know, it, it, we, we're sort of, you know, have seeing Saturn now tipping into Aquarius and coming back. It talks about it becoming more airborne. And um, it seems that, that, so the astrology is pretty clear to me, just, just that superficially, that we were in for a ride that would last for quite some time. And um, because if it's a Saturn-Pluto aspect, which was exact on the 13th of January, um, that struck me as being something that was going to be global and long-term. And, uh, and I just mentioned that I discovered, because it says here that I can speak of one or more facets. One is astrology, which I've done, the personal experiences, my, my dear friends who have it now. And the other factor um, that's so, so important and I think will need to be discussed is the isolation. I mean, even um, extrovert, introverted people are affected by being, because I like my own company. I'm, I'm both introvert, extrovert, exactly 18 on the Jungian scale. But the introversion part of me loves my own company. I think I'm extremely entertaining to myself and I really enjoy it, but I don't enjoy enforced incarceration. And so I thought, well, I'll open with those a few ideas and let everybody else talk about what's been on their mind and how we're finding the psychological effects either in our families or our friends or the neighbors. Um, people that you don't know, just the general ethos that's going on with um, a global pandemic, because it's been, um, you know, gener generations since we've had one before. So let's begin with everybody, you know, taking their time to express their feelings and what they know and what they've seen and how they are with this global pandemic that doesn't look like it's going to end any too soon. Okay, Anthony, please go ahead. Hi, Anthony. Yeah, unmute yourself. I am unmuted. Here I am. Thank you. Well, you are. Thanks. Okay. Um, well, uh, I want to start by saying that uh, 
I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist, and uh, neither do I play one on TV, but I am uh, an astrologer with 34 years of dealing with people and watching them and helping them work through personal issues using the symbolism of astrology. So I just want to mention that where my information is coming from. And I also want to add uh, to anybody listening or watching this either now or later, uh, we may be discussing stuff that could trigger you in many ways. And so I just want to offer two quick phone numbers. Uh, the National Suicide Hotline, you don't have to be suicidal to call them if you're very upset about anything. 1-800-273-8255. I'll repeat this at the end of my chat. And uh, the other possibility, if you're looking for resources, is the resources at the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And that number is 800-950-NAMI. Uh, and I'll repeat them at the end of my chat. And my chat is uh, a little more generic, but it's about the myths of life. And, uh, you know, the biggest myth that we all live with is that we live in a normal world and there is no normal. And uh, what there are, however, is uh, there are times the human world is uh, familiar and repetitive and we accept what, what happens as if it is normal. And, uh, but when we really look at life before quarantine and even during quarantine, is it normal to have slaves? Is it normal to burn people at the stake? Uh, is it normal to have Bezos and Bloomberg and Buffett and Gates earn millions and millions of dollars while people go hungry and can't afford health care? Uh, other myths we use for ourselves, this is a good neighborhood, there, there'll be no problems here. Or uh, how can he have lung cancer? He doesn't smoke. Or uh, work long and hard and you'll do well in life. And all of these are myths and things that we accept and normalize them, but the truth is it can change at any minute and always has. And all it takes is a 9-11 or a pandemic or a JFK's assassination or a stock market crash. And uh, we all freak out because the rules that we try to use are no longer valid. Um, and it isn't really us freaking out, it's Saturn freaking out, okay? Uh, Saturn likes structures, Saturn likes rules. And uh, Saturn sets our parameters, our personal parameters of what is real to us. Um, but it also is a symbol of emotional baggage that we carry with us from childhood. Um, you know, you grow up and daddy's a drunken gambler and you think all well, men are drunken gamblers. You grow up and mommy cheats on daddy all the time and you enter adult life thinking that women cheat on men. Um, these aren't facts but these are beliefs. And as a matter of fact, my favorite sentence about Saturn is that they are beliefs that we think are facts. And when the settled and focused Saturn that we are using sees the world suddenly radically different, we freak out. And I freaked out too. I'm in the middle of New York City. I'm two blocks from Times Square. And you know, two weeks after, uh, after we quarantined, I, I went for a walk. I could have put a blanket in the middle of Ninth Avenue and had a picnic. The streets were empty. It looked like post-apocalyptic America. Um, and on one level that freaked me out, but then I stopped for a second and I looked around and I said, where is everybody? They're in their homes. They're cooperating. Eight million people are cooperating. And that freaked me out too, but in a very different way. Suddenly it was defying my beliefs of like, and we all have them. You can't trust people. They'll try to get you, yada, yada. But here's eight million people trying to work together. So, um, it was freaky to me to see 8 million people cooperating to help all of us together. And that's gonna be a key word that I'll be bringing up uh, later on. Um, Saturn is admittedly one of the toughest symbols to be flexible and have imagination. Uh, you know, but it certainly can be. One of the things about Saturn and even Capricorn in general is that yes, it tends to be tradition oriented, but that's because it works by the concept of track record. Okay, because Saturn and Capricorn are very practical kind of energies. So uh, they are adaptable. If you can prove to person, uh, Saturn or Capricorn that uh, four or five times that this new system works, Capricorn's results oriented, they'll accept it and they'll move forward. So they're not necessarily stuck in the past. And I mentioned this also the other symbol, uh, I'm going to smear Saturn and Capricorn together here, the sea goat symbol. Uh, we have a goat with a fish's tail. I don't know who built that creature, but it can go from the top of the mountain to the bottom of the ocean. So Saturn and Capricorn are flexible. Once a Capricorn or Saturn energy thinks that what they have to do is for the betterment of mankind and themselves, they can go anywhere and do anything once they decide they have to. Uh, of course, the, qu the question is convincing the Capricorn or the Saturn, it's necessary. So the flexibility is there. 
they can do amazing things. And that's really what this is about right now. Uh, the people who are upset and the people who are freaking out uh, are not as being as flexible as possible. They're still trying to return us or believe we should be living a normal, whatever the hell that is, life, you know. Now, I'm not in any way negate, negating the horrors of the illness. Um, you know, there's not just the ones that survive, but some of the people that survive have what are called long haul survivors, and they have medical conditions that have been continued for weeks afterwards, and they're not even similar to each other. So the medical profession is completely baffled. Um, there's also the issues of deaths, and I know many of us, close or otherwise, know people who have died in the hospital and nobody close to them could get to them because of quarantine. And that's a very sad thing. And of course, financially, we're in trouble because even if we cure it tomorrow and get um, you know, vaccines to everybody at the end of October, we've still got a couple of years at least of economic instability and things that have to change. So uh, one of the points that becomes important to me is to remember that we're actually beginning or, or we're knee deep in the age of Aquarius, okay? Uh, we got another 1800 years or so to go, so there's no rush. But I think this is actually forcing us to be more uh, Aquarian, okay? Nothing works anymore. And if nothing works anymore, it's because your belief system isn't working anymore. And Aquari the age of Aquarius to me is demanding a different belief system. You know, the symbolism of Aquarius is the water bearer, somebody who serves mankind. And uh, it's somebody who cooperates. And in order to get to this, you know, we all have to become water bearers. We all have to move forward and realize that this whole top-down system of federal government and whatnot is not functioning particularly well. And all of us as individuals have to come forward and do more and, and take more steps and come up with plan A or B or C or D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, whatever you need. We can't stay hidebound, okay? Uh, and the things I've seen that are positive in their own minor ways, you know, um, I don't know about you, but I have not seen so many photographs of sourdough bread on Facebook in my life because a lot of people took advantage of the spare time to uh, come up with new hobbies. People have been baking bread. People, somebody I know started painting for the heck of it to see what they could do. Uh, and if you are one of those people that had the economic ability to take a break, then it was a wonderful period of time to stop and reassess where you're going and what you're doing. By the same token, a friend of mine, uh, about a month or two into this, decided to start having astrological socials. And I say friend, it's just somebody I knew on Facebook. And she invited about a dozen astrologers that she knew on Facebook. And we met every couple of weeks. I showed up at about half of them. Uh, it was a wonderful experience. I made 12 new friends, uh, people I didn't know that particularly well before. Okay, they were Facebook buddies, but they weren't close friends. Uh, two of the people I've met there, I've had on my, my internet radio show, Cosmic Tuesdays, where I interview astrologers and psychics and feng shui people. And, you, know, you get the point. And I have two more of them that are going to be on the show. So I've discovered four people that I didn't even know before that have enriched my life as an astrologer and enriched my standing as I do my radio show. Okay. By the same token, uh, out of the blue, a group, of, a high school classmate that I graduated with uh, back in 1971, um, sent emails to about a, a couple of dozen high school classmates and said, hey, let's chat if we can't get out. Now, admittedly, it's interesting because these are just random 20 people or so. So we have almost nothing in common other than we went to high school together. But again, there's a social thing. And for me, I'm getting Pluto on my son. I'm happy to look back at, I'm 66, look back at the last 40 years and see, well, where have you changed? How have I changed? So all these things have been um, kind of benefits I've gotten out of this. I mean, okay, the worst curse is I couldn't see relatives. That's a mixed bag. We all know that, okay? Um, so the thing I really feel is incredibly important in all of this is to remember that the basic tenets of astrological transits are deal with it, not try to make it go back to the way it was, okay? I had a friend of mine years ago. She had Mars in Cancer retroing in her fourth house having terrible troubles in her marriage. And she kept calling me up and saying, well, when is this going to be over? And I said, that's not how you deal with this. You have to cope with what's happening. Um, well, she didn't. And four years later, they got divorced. And if that worked out, great. That's wonderful. But that's the point. You get Saturn on your sun. You get Uranus on your midheaven. It's to be dealt with. It's not to be shut down until you know, uh, we can go back to normal. And I think a lot of the agony people are having is their just simple lack of flexibility. Okay. 
um, their lack of, of the beliefs that things can be different and they can always be different. You know, uh, we're in the age of Aquarius. We need to start practicing being more flexible. We have to come up with new ideas and we have to remind ourselves that there is no normal, never was, never will be. There's just us and what we create. And uh, the less hidebound we get, the better we are. And I just want to point out, I got three planets in my midheaven in Capricorn and my rising sign in moon in Taurus. I am not Mr. Flexibility, but I still see the need that it has to change or, or we'll die. And I think it's one of the reasons, because we are knee deep in the age of Aquarius, that more than ever, the progressives and the conservatives are at each other's throats. Because this isn't just oh, back with the New Deal and FDR and things might improve. This is the future we're talking about in a major way. We're trying to set the tone for the next 1800 years. And look, I don't expect paradise in five years, but I think that's the direction you know, we are moving. So uh, be flexible. Remember, there is no normal. And uh, just to mention again, one last time, if you're being triggered by this, if you're very upset, the National Suicide Hotline is one 800 273 8255, 1-800-273-8255, and the National Alliance on Mental Illness, which can give you resources to help yourself, 800-950-NAMI. So that's the story. There's no normal, be flexible, and let's see what we can create. Thank you. Namaste, everybody. I'm on <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah, sure. Oh, thank you so much. That was absolutely fantastic. I mean, I really like the whole um, focus that you made, you know, briefly, but it's intensely of this age of Aquarius that, you know, even Carl Jung wrote about in one of his 20 volumes where the death of the age of Pisces and the growth of the age of Aquarius. And now we've got Saturn entering Aquarius. So that... Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, we're talking about things that are airborne and, you know, that are, you know, in the air. And I think some of the anxiety that people are feeling, um, it, it really relates to a lot of their earliest experience as children, because we are reduced to our, our most um, primal self when we're faced with something this massive. I mean, it has happened before. But, you know, we're not talking about before, we're talking about right now. And so that's why I'm really curious what everybody else has got to say. And so what, Anthony, your introduction, I thought was just really perfect because it opens the door to a lot. Thank you. A lot that people can say. So go, go ahead, whoever is next to talk. Uh, apparently it's my turn uh and Hi. i'm an aquarian and i'm glad everybody really is happy we're heading into the age of oh. aquarius Hi. Uh, enjoy your saturn transit leslie well and I, I i will enjoy it because i have five planets in aquarius so <laughs> it's interesting because uh first of all i i, I just wanted to start it more on a personal level and move to the astrology afterwards uh you know, I, I identified with what Aaron said earlier because I, I enjoy my own company as well. And yet when I was told I couldn't go anywhere, then I was really irritated. Yes. Uh, I should be able to be free to do what I want. Anyway, um, I, I have a couple of really powerful images that I think really describe what this period of time has been like. And on some days it feels like you're under uh, you're underwater with about two tons of concrete on top of you. Hard to breathe. It's hard to feel that there's any space or place to expand or or to grow. Uh, and the other image that really stands out for me, because this is I, I feel like that's a Saturn kind of Neptune image. And then I, from a Plutonian point of view, it it feels like what the rattlesnake snake feels like when the skin comes off of over top of their heads when they, when they shed their skin and the new skin emerges they can't see where they're going i mean i grew up in in a, a place in southern alberta that's semi-desert and every year there would be rattlesnakes ending up in people's yards 
and because they couldn't see where they were going. So right now we have uh, an overwhelming sense, one minute of heaviness and the next minute of complete, uh, uh, a complete lack of sense of where we might be going and where this might take us. And it's funny because when Anthony was talking, it reminded me of something that I had written down, which is, and Saturn is about resilience. And I think that sometimes on our side of the Atlantic, we need to remind ourselves that our ancestors haven't been here that long, our forebearers, and they all came here, or, or most of them came here, uh, without a pot to piss in. And, you know, when I live in the middle of the Canadian prairies, and of course, you know, it's less than a little over 100 years since my family arrived here. And so I keep on reminding my children that, that, that in their family background, in their family genetics is resilience. And that somehow, some way, because humans have always managed to find a way through the darkest times, and I think that sometimes we really need to remember that. And, and it's not always easy right now because what I wrote down is there's no external respite from internal pressure. This has forced us inside. And a lot of people are not very comfortable going inside. And being inside your house with no place to go and being with yourself or your family uh, means that a lot of unresolved stuff is going to surface and it's going to ask us to really get clear what is our life focused on is it a focused on what's going on outside us because i mean uh so many of us i mean making a living and all those other things are important it's just that and of course this goes along with uranus and taurus is do we need to look at materialism? What does it mean? And I don't mean that we should all give up the stuff, especially the books, <laughs> the things that are important to us. But again, it asks us to redefine what is truly important. Not necessarily always from a practical perspective, but from a deeply emotional place, from a place of what is your passion? What truly gets you up in the morning and gets you moving from inside you because pluto is really about what's in here what's really in here i also wrote i now from a personal point of view i mean my family's been very fortunate uh only my one of my children was unemployed was laid off for a couple of months so we've all been you know in terms of this, uh, the challenges that are facing many other people, they've been fine. However, my daughter-in-law's grandmother died of COVID. And uh, I've had, you know, other experiences like and, and uh, sitting with a bunch of astrologers and a couple of them saying that this is all a hoax. And, uh, you know, kind of, you know, then here we have an opportunity to truly get in touch with what other people really believe, as Anthony was talking about before, and how we can all be inhabiting the apparently the same space, supposedly having the same experience, and yet it's so not true. And there is that deeper sense of isolation. And so my, and for me, so what did I do in the middle of a of an, a pandemic, I started a podcast because <clears throat> I wanted to do something creative and uh, it kind of took me way outside my comfort zone. And I think that that is one of the joys that's obvious. And uh, so with Jupiter and Capricorn, how, how do we expand our perception of what the structure of our life actually looks like? which is interesting trying to do that while you feel like you have no structure and everything is, is dissolving. And <clears throat> pardon me, I keep obviously lots of stuff coming up. Uh, how do we do that when it feels like the external part of our lives is not functioning at all? And so 
I truly feel blessed during this period of time. Uh, as I said to many people, I feel like I've been practicing for COVID for a while because I, went, I work out of my house. I spend a lot of time by myself. But I feel a deep compassion for the people who feel like their lives have been turned upside down. Not that I don't feel like that, but I don't have, I haven't had the same kinds of pressures that other people have had. So from a personal point of view, I, I, I bounce back and forth between uh, opportunities to expand myself and then in the next minute, uh, who am I, what am I doing and why am I doing it? And I think that those are questions that we are probably all asking ourselves uh, on one level of it or another. And I'm not keeping track of my time. So um, I think that the, I, I mean, I've encouraged people in some of the writing that I have done and in my podcast, which by the way, I called coloring outside the box, uh, to really have a look at the things that truly um, bring them some sense of, of peace or, or solace because we've been taught for so many years that er, centuries probably that life happens from the outside in and currently that's what we feel like however what happens inside really can shift and change how we experience what's going on in our world uh you know one of the things that remind i kind of want to say this uh i remember during 9-11 I sat like numb and dumbfounded for the first couple of hours as they played over and over again the pictures of the towers collapsing. And I think that this is it, you know, I think there are a lot of people who are numb and feel hopeless. And I'm certain there's a lot of it. And I don't think that there are any easy band aid solutions to any of this. And I appreciate that Anthony shared phone, you know, resources and in Canada, there are the same kinds of resources. And the other thing, of course, is please don't be afraid to turn to the people in your life. Because no doubt if you're experiencing these things, they are too, to one degree or another. So this is a time for us to connect and to share our fears and to share our concerns and to, and to not be afraid for that to surface because i think that's also part of what's going on is you know whatever your fears are i mean they may be so present in your life you can't see past them so one of the things i always suggest to people is if you're really in that kind of a space stop watching the news for starters and go find something to laugh at something that will tickle your fancy that will alleviate your feelings, not because it's going to cure anything or fix anything, because unfortunately none of us has a magic wand. However, doing the things that support you feeling good about yourself, even if it's just for three, four minutes or five minutes, that's better than sitting around, you know, waiting for the sky to fall in. And I think that the range of emotions and experiences that people are having are are profoundly are profound both profoundly disturbing but also profoundly um uh, what's the word transformative because we humans <laughs> don't choose to transform w without a good swift kick in the ass and i think i don't know if i'm almost out of time but i'm going to say uh, thanks for having me on the panel, and I really enjoyed it. Well, thank you very much for what you had to offer. I, I think it was really, it was, re I think the, the personal effect, affect, if you will, and effect is really significant, and it's really was interesting to hear your perspective on that, Leslie. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, oh. I, I think it might be my turn. Hi, Eric. Hi. So um, I just want to reiterate first, you know, what Anthony had said. Um, 
I, I have a degree in psychology. I am not a licensed therapist um, or a clinician by any stretch of the imagination. I do work in human services though. So I've had the opportunity to see this affect a lot of individuals. Um, for those of you that may have missed the phone numbers that Anthony had, had stated, I've put them in the chat room. I've also uh, sent a link out that has numbers for every country on the planet. So even if you're not in the US, you can find them on in Canada, New Zealand, Australia, Great Britain, everywhere around the world is there for you. Um, so um, I'd like to begin by going backwards because I in some respects like to consider myself an astroarchaeologist because <laughs> I like to see what had happened before to get um, a bit of an understanding of where we're going. And I have uncovered something that I think is, is interesting. And after we get onto that, I, I'd like to share some information about um, some coping strategies that I think are, are useful, at least have been for me. Um, so, I'm going to talk primarily about Neptune. And for many of us, you know, we understand that Neptune is the, the great uh, dissolver. It rules delusion and fantasy. Neptune has certainly not been my friend in this lifetime um, so far, but that's kind of besides the point. So Neptune is in Pisces right now. And there were three times in the most recent history, at least for several hundred years, where it has been there. We saw it from 1684 to 1698, then 1847 to 1861, and then what we're currently in, which is 2011 to approximately 2025. Um, I may be slightly off by a year there somewhere, but you get the general idea. So, um, I'm sorry, did you have a question? Okay. <laughs> so, with that, What's fascinating is that when Neptune was in those signs, Uranus was also in Taurus, okay? And I think that that is particularly fascinating because we're having two outer planets doing something very similar during major turning points in history. If we take the first one, that late 1600s, so through like the 1690s, kind of the, the bulk of it, we had the you know, the, the witch hunts, people kind of being afraid of their neighbors, um, spreading at least throughout the United States and certain parts of the world. There wasn't so much of that going on in Europe anymore, but we see a little bit of that today. It's kind of like, oh, are they infected? You know, it's even family members, you know, we have to be worried about, which is, is, is a scary thought. After that, we had the age of reason. It was the enlightenment came. It was this kind of very uncomfortable um, energy that we had to sit with that brought about something better. Then in the 1800s, when we had it again, it was the third and most severe um, cholera pandemic, which killed people globally. And people did quarantine then. They wore masks, they, they isolated, you know. Um, but after that, then we had this big industrial boom at the turn of the century. It was really kind of beautiful. And what we're going through right now you know, we're, we're, we're dealing through some of that again, that Neptune is, for me in Pisces, is in the last sign before it starts its cycle over again. So if we equate, and many astrologers will jump down my throat for this, but I make no apologies associating each sign of the zodiac with a house, Neptune is essentially in the, the last sign of the zodiac. It's, it's in the 12th house right now on, on a flat wheel. It's retreating. Um, it's where we all are right now. We're moving inward. We are looking at self-study in a reflection. There is that seclusion and incarceration that, you know, I, I heard somebody use that word before. Um, <clears throat> it's where we come to kind of make sense of, of life in terms of a spiritual sense. And then we have, we throw Uranus into the mix in Taurus, which revolutionizes our, our core values, you know, what's important to us, where and how do we feel grounded in life. It changes all of those things. So, Lisa, um, was it? Uh, Leslie, excuse me. Um, you know, you said that, you know, suggested that we do stuff that brings us joy, right? It is uh, things that we, we have that moment of, of happiness. And I want everybody to just kind of hold on to that for a second. 
and just take a moment to think about over the last several months since March, there has to have been one moment where you giggled or laughed or, or were happy. And I'm going to get back to that here in a minute. But first, I want to talk about some of my own coping strategies and some of the larger lessons of these planets. A, a very wise astrologer, um, and I'm not going to call them out on this show, recently said to me that um, it was actually during one of those, 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 those Facebook uh, meetup groups, uh, Anthony, that the outer planets kind of get a bad rep for being malefic but it's because we don't typically live long enough or have through the expand of human history to get to the other side of those transits. So we automatically kind of initiate this, you know, ooh, scary boogeyman when Uranus comes across our sun or Neptune moves into our sixth house or wherever, it, you know, whatever may be going on here. But looking at the larger picture, if we understand that it's a cycle and that there is something better on the other side, we can get through anything as long as we know it's not going to last. A transit is a transit and or and an astrological cycle is an astrological cycle. It does not last forever. It's permanent. And I've always believed that if we know something won't last forever, we can get through it. Now, this may be something that lasts for years or decades. Um, it could last for months. You know, it's, it's difficult to say, but knowing that it's, there's something better on the other side in terms of those, those outer transits, like we saw with the Age of Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution, there's something bigger and better coming. Anthony brought that up, you know, with the, the Age of Aquarius. And if we consider the study of times and cycles, we move into periods of involution or dark periods and then light periods. And as we move from one sign to another, you know, we, we start with the dark period, which is all kind of inner reflection, which is uncomfortable for a lot of people, but it allows us to reassess our, our values, what's important to us. Uranus helps kind of shake some of that up. Neptune gives us that opportunity to inwardly reflect. Now, when I said before, think of that one moment in, in time over the last year where you've had that moment of clarity where things felt quote unquote normal, you know, or you were, you were happy. For those of us that deal, like myself specifically, with a great deal of anxiety, I have a lot of anxiety in life. It's, it's a mental health thing that I, I battle every day. But I also know that um, in those moments where any of us are sitting like, oh, this tend I can't see my family, I can't do this, I can't do that, I'm feeling trapped, I'm feeling kind of lost at sea, which is what Neptune does, doesn't it? It throws us into this kind of fog, and it's kind of like we're, we're a ship lost at sea, we can't see the lighthouse. We know that it's there, but we can't see it right now. That moment of, of, of happiness or joy is your lighthouse. Because if you think back, and I think, you know, yesterday I was watching an episode of The Golden Girls, and I laughed... Um, my proverbial hiney off um, watching this. I th think back to that and I'm like, I had a moment where all of my worry just disappeared and dissolved, which means that my state of panic, my state of anxiety, or and even in this larger global pandemic fear um, is not something that has to consume me every moment of every day. It may feel that way, but I know that there are moments where it doesn't. And as long as I know that there are moments where it doesn't, I know that there is another side. And I think that that is incredibly important to remember. And especially with the outer planets, um, we're just, it's, we, we just gotta get to the other side of that transit, which I think is where we are now. Um, I do wanna reiterate one more time that those, those mental health um, resources are in the chat room for everyone. Um, and to just know that, you know, those people are there for you. You are not alone. I am there with you uh, right now and almost every day of my life. Um, but I think to also to the It Gets Better project and um, hold on to that, that, those just tiny moments of happiness because if we have those, right? If we have those, it means that we can come out of whatever we're feeling and be happy again. Um, it may not be the same way, just like it was in the 1600s, where you know we moved from 
superstition into the age of enlightenment and then from hard work into the industrial revolution we're moving into something bigger now which is spiritual but at the end of the day it's just neptune in pisces with uranus shaking things up and it is a very exciting time to be alive and i think if we approach life with gratitude right now to be like i am I hear experiencing this now um, instead of thinking it's happening to me, I think that we can kind of shift our, our approach to some of the fear and anxiety and the panic. Um, and I'm going to stop talking because if I don't stop, my Mercury is in Aries and I have a Leo rising, I will go on for hours <laughs> and you won't be able to shut me up. So thank you again for, for letting me share those thoughts with you. Well, Eric, that was amazing. Um, it's, I, I know this, this is not an insult, but it was very sweet. I mean, what you were, how you were presenting what you were saying and talking about is really, really, really heartfelt. And it, it's, it's very sweet. And so it's very helpful for people to hear this in, in the way you spoke. And um, I wanted to mention um, that the fellow that I was talking about, who's my friend in France, um, who told me, who didn't look very good when I talked to him on Skype and then te texted me this morning or messaged me this morning on email that he and his, his wife or partner have been tested positive for COVID. And so of course I you know, looked, knew his chart really well because I've known him for ages and he has the transit of Neptune exactly on his IC in Pisces, exactly. And it's been transiting back and forth his son. And so, I would never say that, you know, a Neptune transit is going to bring a global uh, plague to you, but uh, it is very, it's, it's interesting that this fellow who has been a very, very ser seriously public figure and, um, you know, for 50 years, he's extremely well known. And he's got this Neptune transit as well as his progressed moon conjunct Chiron. And I thought, well, the astrology is really pretty literal because it is something that's really vague. Um, we don't really know what COVID is. It's been named, it's been, it's being, you know, looked at. I've got a very close friend, Dr. Larry Brilliant, part of our old hog farm group, who's an epidemiologist and they, he's and his, his colleagues are working night and day. Scientists love this kind of stuff because, you know, not because it's hurting people, but because they're get to do some really intensive work. So there's a kind of positive side, if you will, to what's coming because people are working to find a resolve to this. And it has happened before. I mean, this Dr. Larry Bryan, I mentioned, wiped out smallpox in India. There's no blindness anymore because he's taught everybody how to do cataract surgery. I mean, there are going to be resolutions to this situation because there are people who know what they're doing when it comes to epidemiology so i'm i'm you know i i'm enjoying my time alone i think it's it's absolutely fine um you know i'm you know wonder what i'm going to be doing next but that's what we're all doing how are we going to get through this mm -hmm. so for the next speaker I want you to tell us what you think is happening and what's been going on and what you, your whole mind is saying. So I'm going to live it, oh, turn it over to you. Hello, everyone. My name is Marie O'Neill, and I am also an astrologer. In addition to that, I'm a life coach. So I work with people every day with, you know, helping them to resolve their issues and of course, this year, we, we know what we've been dealing with. Um, what I've, the questions that I've been getting from the people who come to me is why? Why do we need to do, deal with this? And I, what I find, I mean, for me personally, I'm a Saturn and Capricorn person, 29 degrees. So, <laughs> I mean, I'm always, I mean, I'm pretty logical, and but I always like to look at why myself, why things are happening, what is this about, what am I supposed to learn from this? So the people who come to me are asking these questions. Most of them 
are not astrologers or you know have uh, much knowledge about astrology so i do my best to keep it simple and keep it in layman's terms for people and the overarching reason in my opinion that we're going through this is it's time for us to deal with our own fears i mean we have we're dealing with fear um, on different levels in our lives i mean of course we know with coronavirus we're uh, we're looking at what's going on with our environment um, you know, how we need to change our lives. We're, we're looking at, at all of that. But, you know, there's this fear that each person has. And, and this is why we have the anxiety. This is why we have, um, you know, the need to break free. I mean, it's like we want to break free from the chains and, and we, we are acting out. We're, um, and it's, almost as though we're like throwing terrible tantrums or two-year-olds in, in some respects. But each of us is dealing with the fear. And when we're dealing with fear, we have to look at Saturn. Uh, as Anthony was saying, we also need to look at Pluto, but I look specifically at Saturn and where uh, Saturn is in the chart because this is going to tell us what our blocks are, what we need to, you know, how we need to um, need to work on it. But when people are coming to me and I'm talking to them about fear, I'm also talking to them about how they can work with the fear. And it's not really at this point about getting the fear to go away completely because there's so many different levels of it. And I tell people, of course, we need, you have to have community. And your community can be just your family or it can be your friends, but you must have community. This is not something that you can deal with on your own. Um, I mean, it's, you've got to have someone that you talk to. If you, you know, talk to every day or, or several times a day if you need to. At least this is what I recommend for people. And I do this myself with my own friends. I have friends that I talk to sometimes several hours every day. And it's how we are keeping ourselves level. I mean, we're not necessarily healing, but we're able to cope. And we're able to take one step and put one foot in front of the other. So community is what I tell people they need to do, but they also need to look at the big picture if they can. Sometimes people aren't able to look at the big picture. I do, because if I know what the big picture is, I can deal with anything. If I know what my goal is, and, and oh, yeah, I can deal with just about anything, whatever the pain may be that I'm dealing with. And um, I do tell people about their fears. I talk to them about that. I talk to them about um, the big picture of the coronavirus uh, when they, you know, when they ask. I do a Facebook live talk uh, every Monday night that I started right after the pandemic talking about the why of the coronavirus, what it is we're here to do. And everyone who has spoken so far here, in my opinion, is absolutely correct. It's time for us to go inward to look at our own issues to deal with them because of course we haven't done that in the past we've found all sorts of ways to distract ourselves and now we're you know being given an opportunity to uh, look within not everybody wants to do that though and that's okay too we'll get plenty of opportunities the other thing that i tell in which i do believe uh, because I believe this is, of course, the beginning um, of a big, huge shift that is going on. I don't believe, and, and I tell my clients and my friends this, I don't believe we can go back to the way things were because I don't think we're supposed to. I mean, we are moving towards, we are either in the Aquarian age or we're on the cusp of it. Either way, we can't go backwards. We have to go forward. 
there's baggage that each of us is carrying that we cannot take into the future. It's not in our best interest to do that. The Aquarian age requires an entire new, it's a new paradigm, it's a new way of being. And so we have to put on our big shoes <laughs> and work on our stuff and move forward. So for those who are dealing with uh, this crisis and you're dealing, you know, and you're having a difficult time, I say, oh, in addition to having community, take this one step at a time. Come up with a plan for dealing with the stress and you implement that plan whenever you feel the stress. The stress can be, you know, there's, there's an ebb and a flow to stress. Sometimes you're feeling less stressful and sometimes more stressful. So when you're feeling less stressful, that's when you sit down and you come up with a plan, something that you can do, actively do, to help you get through this period. And it could be writing or talking to friends. It could be starting something new, just like Leslie said, she started a podcast. One of the biggest things that you can do to help yourself is to be of service, service to somebody else. It could be your next door neighbor is old, has a dog and can't take the dog out for a walk. You do it. I mean, it's, it helps you, it, it, um, it increases the um, forum pheromones in our brain uh, to be of service, to be giving. If you, I also find that people who are in service tend to have a better attitude towards what is going on in their lives. I mean, how many of us feel, I mean, we receive far more than we give. So having community, having friends, being of service, figuring out why you're going through this, coming up with a plan to uh, help yourself when you're feeling stress, these are all, all ways that you can support yourself. Um, I, you know, when I look at this big picture, I mean, yes, I know what the big picture is, and yet I still deal with my own stressors. As a matter of fact, um, in addition to the coronavirus, I was evacuated for uh, a few days because of the fires, because I live in Northern California. What I've been hearing from people uh, out up here is, oh my God, it's one more thing just one more thing and, and it's constant one more thing. I think we need to change I think we need to change that wording because um, we're also being asked to be flexible. And I believe it was Anthony who was talking about the need to be flexible and the need to just open ourselves up because remember, change is constant. It, it, I mean, and what we've been trying to do is we've been trying to keep change from happening. We've been trying to control our lives and control other people's lives for that matter. And we're being shown that we can't control anything. We can only control how we respond to the situation that is presented to us. I find that when I am restrictive and remember, Saturn and Capricorn can be extremely restrictive with themselves and extremely controlling. I find that I do much better when I am open and accepting. I mean, it doesn't mean that I like what happens. No. At the same time, I accept what happens and I say, what can I do about the situation? What can I do to help me move through this situation. I don't linger on what has actually happened. So it's, um, it's I, I look at each situation differently. Um, if I can change something, 
about a situation or change my response to a situation, I will. And I implore you to do the same because in addition to everything that is happening, like I said, you're also being asked to be okay with change, to accept it, to, um, it, to just be open. And you'll find, what I find, is that a lot of positives happen. Uh, when you relax, it's so much easier. I tell you, in January, I had a pretty serious car accident where I was driving on a two-lane highway, someone had a diabetic episode, crossed in my lane, I hit them going 45 miles an hour, totaled my car. The front end of the car went into the windshield. I ended up with, no, with very little injury. I ended up with just some soft tissue injury. Why is that? Because I didn't see the accident coming and I wasn't able to tense up. So I fared much better because I was relaxed and open. And when we have something happen to us, I mean, with coronavirus, with anything, if we tense up, we're gonna cause ourselves a lot more suffering than we actually have to. Pain is going to happen. Suffering is optional. We do not have to suffer. Let go, relax. Do, work with your community. If you need something, ask. If you can be of service, be of service. I say this because this is the way our lives are going to be for a long time. We're constantly dealing with these changes. We're setting the seed. We're sowing the seeds of what this Aquarian age is going to be. Each of us is. And what we're doing is, in addition to that, is letting go of what no longer serves us. We're being asked to do that. I ask you to let go. Let go and let God. That's what I was told. That's how I live my life. And that's what I ask you to do. Thank you so much. That was really, really beautiful personal experience that you're having and it's it's so good to hear someone talking about that about what it was like you know what it's like for you personally and what your your belief system is because it seems to work very well on your behalf and i'm sure that you spread that when you're talking with your groups and friends that you've managed to get collect in this time frame but you know um but the thing that that struck me most as you're talking about the age of Aquarius and funnily enough I've just been writing a note here that I wanted to talk about set just for a sec that um that, that we have we, we have to take um not to a, a point of, of becoming mentally ill over it but we do have to take personal responsibility for what's going on with the earth because we've basically trashed it mm -hmm. and it's also overpopulated it's become absolutely, so there's going to be millions and millions of people will die. And I know this sounds really awful, but the fact is, is that the planet can't hold this anymore. It can't hold the, 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 the garbage and the trashing and the lack of care and nurture that planet Earth really deserves. And um, I was just feeling that it would be very important that we have a really nurtured Mother Earth in the age of Aquarius becoming you know, uh, upon as we are, as we enter the limb of it um, and get into the liminality of what Aquarian can be, is that it is it, yes, it's humanitarian, but it's also very cold. It doesn't have a lot to do with a lot of mushy, you know, feely, touchy kind of experience. It has to do with being observant, aware, conscious, um, and working in favor of the collective because Aquarius is a collective uh, sign and so I think that what we're doing in this pandemic is we're psychologically preparing not only ourselves but future generations because not you don't have to be related to a young person for our, us as elders in the community let's say everybody else is much younger than us um, that I'm talking about we have to act as as uh, you know, resources and also examples 
and exemplars of how to act under this kind of condition because that's the world that they are growing into. My grandchildren are all over 20. Yeah, my kids are over 50. I'm 73. So, I mean, I'm looking at, or I will be in a month, um, I'm looking at, you know, what are my, I know what my kids are experiencing, what my grandchildren are going to inherit is a planet that needs more care. And so really it has, it really has a lot to do with a complete and utter rejection of the human condition um, as we have not you or me personally necessarily but how we have collectively not paid attention to the needs of the planet and so i'm just throwing that in as part of what you had said marie that was so good thank you very much you're welcome thank you yes go ahead mitchell Oh, what do I do here? It's okay, we can hear you. All right, but can you see me? I'm not up on the screen. Yes, we can see you. Oh, uh, there. Hello. Hello, everybody. This, so far, this has been just fascinating. Uh, I'm thrilled to hear everybody's opinions about all of this and the mixture of knowledge and concepts and how we approach these subjects from different points of view. A couple of things I want to get uh, off first. Uh, in April, I was diagnosed with COVID-19. And uh, I have a strong immune system. I'm okay. It was weeks and weeks of uh, lingering effects, all different sorts of things, a rash, a headache you, <laughs> you couldn't believe, and shortness of breath, which took about six weeks really to recover from. Um, and of course, at the same time, I was on Facebook and I had to do my work and I had to do my readings. I have a very big clientele. And uh, I had to read these conspiracy theories about how uh, Bill Gates created the virus so he could sell you vaccines and all the other stuff that went out there. A um, couple of notes. For one thing, uh, in, I, one of my specialties is medical astrology. And I do several hundred medical reads a year, and I lecture about it, and I'm working on a book, which if I live long enough, I'll finish. And uh, I'm dealing with a lot of people right now, of course, because of COVID, but also because of their fear. And that's really what we're talking about here. There are more antidepressants and anti-anxiety prescriptions being filled today than ever. Uh, people are frightened of the political situation, the financial, economic situation, and they're very, very frightened of COVID. And we, we talk about the, uh, a recurring theme for most of you has been the Aquarian age and our entrance into the Aquarian age. Uh, in 2012, I lectured down in New Orleans at the United Astrologers Conference. And uh, I was looking for something a little unusual to, to do. So I decided, uh, what I did was I said to, the, to my audience, what if this was the year one? Jesus had just been born, and astrologers knew we were entering a new age, the age of Pisces. What would you tell your audience? If they were made up of astrologers, laymen, or a combination of both, how would you explain what they could expect over the next 2,000 years? We understand that, that Christianity, or monotheism, if you will, uh, is one of the main themes of the age of Pisces. And uh, assuming that Jesus was born around that time and it was the beginning of Christianity, it took until the year 312 for Constantine to declare Christianity the, uh, the religion of the Roman Empire, 300 years. And then in 1517, Martin Luther nailed his edict to the door of the, of the church and created the Protestant Revolution. And so the... My, my feeling about the age of Aquarius is it's not a revolutionary thing. It doesn't happen over a long weekend in the Hamptons. It's an evolutionary period that is going to take many, many, many years. And we are going to go through all different sorts of times and sorts of events that are going to push us into the Aquarian age. So what does Aquarius mean? Now we all interpret these things, of course, in our own way. But Aquarius rules the 11th house of the Zodiac. The 11th house is the house of large groups. 
it's not, it's the opposite sign of Leo or the fifth house that is the individual's creativity. So essentially what's happening now isn't so much a radical change as a metaphor for what society has become. Uh, brick and mortar stores were already in trouble. Now they are closing by the hundreds, thousands. Companies are going out of business left and right. You sit in front of your computer, you click here and you get your stuff shipped to you. This is all Uranian, Aquarian. Oh, and by the way, when we speak of, of the sign of Aquarius, uh, while I do use the modern rulerships, and I believe the external planets, the outer planets are extremely active and quite real, I still look at the ancient rulers too. I give Mars co-rulership of Scorpio. I recognize its, its uh, power there. I also know that that uh, uh, Saturn, while it rules Capricorn, also has a tremendous effect over Aquarius. If you know Aquarians, and one of you ladies said you had five planets in Aquarius, there you are. Uh, there are Saturnine Aquarians and there are Uranian Aquarians, and they are quite different. I have a lot of Aquarian friends, love Aquarius. If, if nothing else, they are never boring. <laughs> and their, their ability to see, well, some of them are kind of, uh, I don't want to say stuck in the past, that's more Capricornian thing, but they are very Saturnine in their, their need for stability. Don't forget Aquarius is a fixed sign. It's not a mutable or cardinal sign, it's fixed. We don't think of it that way because we think of the erratic, sudden changes of Aquarius, but still in all, Aquarians will say, it's black, it's black, it's black, it's, black. it's white, it's white. Now you can't convince them that it's black. They've changed their mind, that's it. So as we enter the age of Aquarius, we are dealing with two things. One is that we are dealing with the collective. Aquarius, Uranus, the 11th house, rules corporations. It rules large groups of people. Now the individual should not get lost in that, obviously, but we now have computers that will write novels. I'm a novelist. I'm not happy about that. I still think I'll write a better novel than a computer will, but who knows what'll happen in 20 years? They'll take a little of this and a little of that, and they'll put this together with, with uh, you know, whoever you like, Kurt Vonnegut, then this author, and boom, and they got a new novel, and it sells 4 million copies. And the guy sat there and pushed a button, and it, and it wrote the thing for him. So the changes that we're going through are quite unique, uh, but they are always unique. The Black Plague hit Europe. This is not, thank God, a pandemic like that. But the Black Plague wiped out more than a third of the population of Europe in a relatively short period of time. Before the Black Plague, Europe was overcrowded. There was no room for growth. There was no land. The towns were completely chaotic and overbuilt. And it was a terribly, uh, you know, study, if you study history and you read up some of the books that have been written about it, uh, uh, Barbara Tushman's uh, Distant Mirror is a great example. And then the plague hit. And afterwards, there was plenty of room. There was land to grow. And what happened was new ideas started to come out because we needed a cleansing. Now, we all know that Pluto, if, if you do any medical astrology, Pluto rules the parts of the body that eliminate waste. It rules the colon, the erythra, the sweat glands, even the tear ducts, because the tear ducts wash the dirt out of the eyes. And anything that is removing waste is Pluto. It rules the bathroom, it rules the garbage pail, the garbage disposal, all of these things. If you see Pluto in a horary chart, somebody lost their, their engagement ring, and Pluto's right on the ascendant, or it's very prominently placed, tell them to look in the garbage, they may find. So America's going through its Pluto return, and Saturn conjuncts Pluto in Capricorn. And by the way, I'm a tw I'm, my son opposes uh, Anthony Pico's by just a, about a degree and a half. So I'm a 22 and a half degree Cancer. That conjunct in January was 22 and a half degrees. Boom, I got COVID-19. Okay, you know, I can't blame the stars. I don't think they're doing anything to us, but the timing was absolutely perfect. <clears throat> what I, when I deal with this, because the real issue, the real question today that we're trying to answer is, what do we do with our loneliness, with our isolationism? 
Well, when somebody has a health issue, I tend to go to a series of, of suggestions, and that's what they are, they're suggestions, that include exercise, an easy to digest diet, meditation, anything that is life affirming. I will tell a client, listen, you're going through some very, very difficult times. You should be on probiotics. You should change your diet a little bit. You should exercise, but don't try to do everything once because you'll fail. Try and do 20 things, you're going to fail. Do one at a time. Take the probiotics first, maybe take long walks. These things move the chi in the body. They clean us out, but not just physically, spiritually and psychologically too. And so what I feel is happening in our society is that we are all being pushed to a wall. The whole society is. The mask, it makes me crazy. I want to go out to dinner, how I miss restaurants. I live in New York, there's 40,000 restaurants and I can't go to any. So we need to move that energy. And the ways that we do it, that we can do it as an individual, is through our, we can only change ourselves a little bit. We certainly can't change anyone else. So by using the techniques that we have learned in whatever studies you've done, they're all pretty much the same. I've been meditating for decades. Uh, I eat a 90% plant-based diet. I uh, exercise regularly. I live in New York, so I can walk from the Upper East Side down to the village and back, and there's a lunatic on every corner to entertain me. So, you know, I, I get the exercise done. And it makes me feel more alive and more affirming. And so when I get up in the morning, sometimes I get up and I say, oh my God, who's in the White House? I can't believe it. And the COVID is still here, and the economy is crashing, and I don't know what I'm going to do. And First thing I do is I meditate. Actually, I drink a glass of uh, lemon water and make sure I clean my teeth because it dissolves the uh, enamel. And then I take a long walk for miles. Then I come back and I sit in front of my computer just like I am now and I answer my emails and I talk to my clients and I start writing my next book and I do whatever it is I got to do. And right now, because Pluto is making the last opposition to my son, I am redoing my entire apartment. Anything that is old and worn out is going. I bought a new shredder. I must have shredded 5,000 pages in the last week and a half. I can't tell you how much crap I had here. I had to get rid of it. I am buying the second desk that I need. I'm doing whatever I need. I needed a little thing for my kitchen because in New York City, you have tiny little kitchens. I'm doing all of that. Unfortunately, I have to order most of it online because that's the only way you can get anything. And like I said, as we enter deeper into the Aquarian age, we can't fight what is. We have to accept it and work within that framework. If Macy's goes out of business and they no longer have a Thanksgiving Day parade, I'm going to be heartbroken. How am I going to explain to young people what Miracle on 34th Street was all about? Already I have to tell them what Gimbel's was. What if I have to explain to them what a super, uh, what is, what a, um, uh, a, a department store was, and God forbid, what the post office was. So we have to accept what is, and what Macy's is doing, just for example, because I also trade stocks a lot, Macy's is closing hundreds of their stores, and they are focusing much more online. They do not want to go out of business, so they are changing with the times. And that's what we all have to do. And because we're in the middle of a pandemic, what we need to do is affirm our own health, psychologically, spiritually, and physically. So I, I'm not sure what my time is, uh, if I have a few minutes left or not, but I don't want to run over because I know time is, is very short. And everybody needs to have their, their moment here. Um, anyway, just to, to tie this all up, this, we don't know what's a curse and what's a blessing? Sometimes you race to make a plane and you can't make it and oh my God, I'm gonna be late. I can't get to Miami and something happens to the plane. And you go, oh my God, thank God I didn't get up. We can't see what the end results of this pandemic is going to be or what the, even the immediate end results are going to be. Um, so 
you go, you go through it every day, as some of you have talked, Marie, and, and, and uh, I forget who the other names are, because they're not all up here. Sorry, I, I don't know most of you. But you talk about that healing and how we can direct our energy into a positive way. That's exactly what we need to do. COVID-19 isn't going away. It is going to become part of our society you will get tested for it for years. A vaccine, from what I can understand, I'm not an immunologist, but from what I understand, that these viruses will mutate, sometimes to a benign form, sometimes to a much more virulent form. But it looks like this is going to be with us for some time. And as we do destroy the planet, as Aaron was quite correct in pointing out, we're going to be dealing with other pandemics because we are going to be releasing things from the ancient forests uh, that have been buried for a long time that humanity has no resistance against. So this is just the first of one of many. What we need to do, if I had the power, if I was the, the, the Lord, redesign everything in our society. And people do not change until they're in pain. Oh, you've been smoking 30 years. The doctor says, well, you know, when I see something, I, oh my God, I'll quit smoking. And then you make the change. That's what the society has to do too. We're in pain, so we have to change. And we are gonna change. Beginning on November 3rd, there's going to be a big change. And then there are going to be other changes over the coming years that are going to help us direct our energy and God willing, save the planet. Anyway, I think my time is probably up and thank you so much for inviting me. This has been great fun and I love listening to all of you. Um, keep in touch. Thanks, Mitchell. That was intense. <laughs> didn't mean it to be. I'm very passionate. Oh no, it was, I, I loved every minute of it. I mean, I, I was, you know, really relating to um, the part while we're, you see, I feel that the collective responsibility of the world, sometimes not just be, just be, say in India, and in poorer parts of India, there's all sorts of, you know, very distraught Mexico, et cetera, places um, who aren't conscious of the need for environmental protection. And so, um, you know, we are, we're conscious of, separating out plastic from paper and et cetera, you know, just so. Oh, but, if you, but if you live in Flint, Michigan, Aaron, you'll, you'd look at it a little differently, I think. Anyway, oh, go ahead. I'm well, sorry. I live in Santa Fe, but I'm Canadian. I'm from Victoria, BC. <laughs> so, and I, and I maintain that's my, my allegiance. I'm still Canadian, but, um, but I've lived here for God knows off and on for years in many countries. But I think what's happened really is, is that we've just kind of, uh, trashed Mother Earth, mm -hmm. and uh, and there's we're having the the results of it are coming up environmentally because there's not been proper treatment of water of the Earth of the planet itself, yep. and and so it makes sense that on the verge of of a you know a two thousand five hundred year shift in consciousness, you know because we're looking not I mean you and I won't be aware that when we wake up one morning it's the age of Aquarius and all of a sudden, you know, we're all, you know, detached and, you know, intellectual and, you know, very interesting, but, you know, eccentric. Um, it's not going to happen like that, but it seems that at the end of eras, and I looked back to some historical time periods, where at the end of an era, there's always some kind of pandemic. And it's a sign that people have used enough energy and life and time and goods and so forth. And um, this is one way of putting, you know, people not going out shopping. Um, you know, the whole, uh, fortunately, we're in a time frame of Sperry Aquarian online. Everything gets delivered in boxes and you can wash your hands and and you open your box of whatever you've ordered. But it, it is, it's a very strange time to be existing in. And one which, you know, gives everybody this um, 
really a, a great opportunity to philosoph to be philosophical, to try and understand the truth of the matter. Philosopho, sophist from the from the Greek means the love of wisdom, and so you know to be philosophical, and and not to inter in you know sort of indulge, if you will, in fear and anxiety and panic and anger and rage but to but to use the time creatively like many of you guys all are which is contacting friends online or by the i phoned up a friend last night just out of the blue she's in the line shopping for food so we had a great talk until it was time to check out and so i mean it's just really a, t a time to reach out and to not isolate to the degree that you know many of us are forced to do. Uh, I, I don't really, you know, I find it sort of interesting because I said earlier um, that I have a really strong introverted part of myself. I love my own company, but I, I don't really like it being forced upon me. And so, you know, I really have to deal with that. I have to deal yes. with it. But Aaron, if I may just interject one thing. Yeah, in please. 1918 and 19, right. the, uh, the influenza epidemic yeah. killed 50 million people in yeah. a matter of six months. Quite. And as soon as it was over, everybody ran out into the streets and partied, and we had what was called the Roaring Twenties. Oh, yeah. and, it, and it took 20 years to grow a new crop of young men and women to throw them back into the fodder of war. So, as the fodder of war. And uh, fodder, I mean, no, sorry. Um, so, what lessons we learned or don't learn from each of these episodes as individuals or as a collective. Yeah. There were many very smart people after the First World War, which, which was called the War to End All Wars. Yeah. Who warned immediately, we're on the verge of a bigger war. Oh, they yeah, knew yeah, this, right this, this is global war. We're in global war. You know, I mean, we are involved in it, even though not actively participating with troops and so on and invading countries but it's much more insidious isn't it mm -hmm. i mean sure. it, and it is a globe we are we are in world war three all one person has to do is push that button i know and it could happen at any moment but that's not but we're here today i, 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 think, here, to, I think to find good. hope and not not to freak people out so well, exactly. <laughs> yeah. i think that's what we're all trying to do is we're really trying to know give our personal philosophy that gives us a support like how is it you're staying alive how is it that you're not going crazy you know all by yourself i mean so each of us has our our opportunity to say well look this is this is how i'm not going crazy i mean i'm obviously you know a bit neurotic about certain things but um i've actually enjoyed this this opportunity if you will to um to do a lot of self work and so self have I. I love being alone to tell you the truth yeah but not, but not all the time well exactly that's that that's what i was saying earlier is that i just don't like being told what to do so you know that that that's i'll end on that note and <laughs> give the speak, next speaker something this to is great thank you all right lot thank you so much mitchell okay hi nura here so I just, I love this conversation so much. Um, <laughs> those questions, Aaron, you know, how are we staying alive? How are we not going crazy? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's endless. And I feel that what's come up for me the most is really just a greater awareness of the ongoing initiatory nature of life. And of course, I can't help but go to these deeper places. I'm part of the Pluto and Scorpio generation, so I'm always asking the why, um, <laughs> the deeper, deeper, deeper why. And so, of course, I want to talk about uh, Pluto and Saturn today. Um, but really, to get this kind of the personal why and interlace it with the collective why. And for me, that actually gives me a lot of hope because it. You know, I'm also a Sagittarius, so I have the tendency to ascribe meaning to everything that happens, but that is actually what helps me to not be crazy. Because if I'm just accepting things at face value and like, oh, there's no reason for this, it's really easy for me to slip into meaninglessness. 
um, which is kind of the worst thing for, for the Sagittarius. And so then I think, okay, the South Nodes in Sagittarius, what belief systems are coming up for people that are probably being challenged? Um, the things and the internal structures, which are typically our beliefs and our perspectives of life, those are being challenged. And the ones that don't really serve us are being purged, but then we're kind of left with this vacuum. And then what are we filling it with? Are we filling it with the misinformation? This is that North Node Gemini. Oh, there's all of this duality. There's, there's truth, there's lies, there's people purposefully, you know, for the, you know, with the intention of, uh, you know, making a mess or adding, you know, the things like the conspiracy theories just to, you know, bring more confusion. So really, I feel like this whole time is part of this initiation for each of us, both individually and collectively collectively because it's always one and the same right as above so below microcosm macrocosm we're all it's all the same thing um we're really learning how to separate you know the wheat from the chaff and and we're learning how to tune in more to our own personal filter to know how we can stay in an in integrity with our soul level purpose that pluto piece so that might mean that there's certain structures in our lives that have to fall away in order for us to be able to see that. Um, kind of like, you know, in Buddhist philosophy, it's not necessarily about finding your purpose or necessarily finding happiness somewhere outside of you, but it's clearing away everything that's on top, that's in the way of knowing that intrinsically within ourselves. And I feel like, so of course for me, I've got all of the Saturn, Pluto, Jupiter, right on my midheaven, Capricorn. And so, Personally, this it has affected my work. Um, I was a substitute teacher, so then when the schools closed down, I was out of work, but luckily able to continue with astrology. And I'm kind of that, you know, the type of person I'll just follow my nose until, you know, I'm like, okay, this looks good. I'm going to keep following the breadcrumbs and go that way until there's nothing else over there. And then I'll, you know, just keep following. Um, so I was, you know, doing more astrology things, but then this. <sighs> The collective piece, especially, I'm, I'm really close to Portland, Oregon right now, but I'm Canadian. And so I, I also have a lot of like ideas about the world and society and how it's supposed to be and what I'd like it to look like. And, and then I see, you know, the Black Lives Matter protests and, and the, the homeless situation. And there's a lot of people suffering. And then there's a pandemic and then there was the wildfires. So like, um, like Maria said, it's like, how many more things can we stack on top of each other? Um, and, and how do we really find our purpose in the world and in a structure of reality that's totally shifting? So for people who've lost their jobs or have had to pivot and focus on something else, what is the, what's really grounding you if your belief system is being shaken to the core? Because for some people, it is that, you know, whether it's, you know, I believe in the law of attraction, or I believe in a deity, or I believe in a psychology or a process or whatever it is that's getting us kind of to that next place where we need to go if that very core is being shaken what are our beliefs about society what are our beliefs about where we're going as a collective um, that's being dismantled so we have to be really intentional about what we're replacing those things with and this is where I feel like the initiation is, is really just to come to greater clarity, um, knowing who we are and also knowing um, where and when we are in our personal cycles and how that also connects with the collective cycles. So I actually have something that I want to share because this is kind of like a, a tool that has really changed my life as i think everybody who's in astrology it's like once you once you go in you're not you're not going back so can everybody see this chart yes okay so this is just a chart that i made it's by no means exhaustive but it has along the bottom or x-axis the ages and I, they're just divided by four and then along the side some of the key life cycle times that are delineated either by um, conjunctions or squares trines oppositions all of the different things um, and so there's a couple different entry points into understanding your purpose right now and kind of where to put the focus so that you can start to differentiate for yourself as an individual. Um, what are you also therefore contributing to 
collectively. So I'll do my own example. Um, I'm 31. I'm at the tail end of my Saturn return in Capricorn. And I'm also going through a couple other cycles. So I'll be 32 soon. The Venus and Mars cycle is coming to a head. So there's a lot of relationship things going on for me. Um, Saturn being on my mid heaven, I'm like, what am I literally doing out in the world? And what does the world also need from me? Because now it's not really like, oh, what do I just want to do? It's like, what does the world need? And, and so I'm kind of having to reposition myself according to, to that awareness. So you can take a look at where, where do you fall? And, um, you know, say the people who are going through their Chiron return right now, my mom is in that wheelhouse. So she's, you know, she's someone who has always been, um, she's a Taurus with a Virgo rising, part of the Pluto and Virgo generation. And she's always been really by the book and really, um, I don't know, I, I wouldn't say super esoteric or very interested in the otherworldly thing. She kind of looked at me with astrology. was like, hmm, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> but now she's starting to have these really um, profound wisdom downloads and in these insights and i really think that she's extremely psychic and doesn't even really know it so these kinds of things are happening for her and i see her position in the world you know she's an accountant working from home kind of doing what a lot of other people her age and in her demographic are doing um but she's kind of adding this energy of a soothing nature so her purpose in relation to this time is kind of make people feel a little bit better, but also help them stay grounded and practical, um, help them to find themselves. So we all have our own way of doing that. Uh, and depending on where we are, say we're in you know, a Saturn cycle, in what way are we contributing positively to the structure of reality? If we're in some sort of predominant Uranus cycle, or transit? Um, are we doing some profound awakening work for ourselves or for others? Are we challenging the status quo? Are we perhaps on the streets in the protests um, doing the activism work? Um, are we doing it loudly or quietly? Again, there's no right answer. It's kind of everybody has their own trajectory and their own entrance point into their soul work, but it's all so important. And I think for me, that's what keeps me grounded is knowing that, you know, I wouldn't be here if I wasn't supposed to be here. I wouldn't have the chart that I have if I wasn't supposed to use it in a certain kind of way. We wouldn't be going through these transits if we weren't supposed to respond to them in a certain way. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure if anybody has any comments on that or, or has a question. So if you're watching this, you can screenshot it. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. Um, but for now, I'll stop sharing that and just end with how important I think it is for all of us to acknowledge that everybody's coming from a completely different angle here. And that especially, I, I love this conversation too, the scope of all of the different um, ages in this conversation. Um, that we have multi cross uh, generational conversations because especially when we're talking about, you know, history and an understanding of, of history, it's one thing to read about it in a textbook. It's another thing to talk to somebody who might have lived through that um, and, and kind of get the, the information and the wisdom spread from a lot of different angles so that we're not limited in our perspective. I think that's really what uh, Pluto is asking us to do as we transform our way of really perceiving the structure of reality as we really transform how we how we allow those internal structures to also narrate our lives too so the more we're able to connect with those internal structures and know who we are the, the easier these times will be but also so that we can stay open um, as marie said as everybody's kind of alluding to to stay open to um the potential and the possibility for things to actually be built up into something even better because maybe this is one of those godsend moments where we're like oh the whole structure is crumbling this makes it a little easier for us to rebuild what we really want so um that's that's my uh hopeful view for the future well thank you that's fantastic Nura, that diagram is brilliant um i would love a copy of it 
because yeah. when I was looking at it, I was looking at, you know, of course, about it's all about me, right? So I wanted to see where I was. And um, but what you're talking, what you're talking about, this business of generations. Now I'm I'm 73, or I will be next month. And I was I came into uh, my um, grow my years. I was very active in the 60s, and oh, uh, you know, we we actually my group set up. We we set up Woodstock, so we did that, and I did light shows for rock bands and. You know, so I was like deeply invested in just the play of the whole out and what was going on. And we were, we were nonviolent aspect, you know, um, we were not advocating what was going on around us. And so what we did was we, we our philosophy was, okay, I'm just going to work just as hard as the bad guys, only doing good. And so, you know, we did good. So when, at Woodstock, we set up how to feed like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. We had no idea that there would be this big. But the minute we found out, we tore down the fences, let, let people in, just don't even worry about it. Made, you know, somebody, we just got five grand from, uh, the, from our, our sponsor and bought all this cooking material. I would cook food for like 250,000 people for breakfast. Um, you know, as Wavy Gravy said, you know, breakfast in bed for 250,000 people. And so, you know, that was the reaction that we had. And I think what my problem, if I'm having one, is that, um, and my kid, my grandchildren are now the age that I was then, okay? So, and they're really active, but not, it's, there is no movement. You see, they, they don't have a movement. There is no movement going on. There is no radical, you know, um, attachment that's going on to try and change the world in some active way. And so it makes it makes it very makes me very curious as to what what the flat line is that's going on right now. Because I don't really I don't really quite get the the fact that there's you know so little in the way. I see individuals say in this group finding ways of changing and working and dealing with the situation, talking to other people, et cetera. But I don't understand why there's no, uh, there hasn't been any kind of collective younger people action. And my, one of my granddaughters who is very uh, active in, as an artist, um, in Portland, in fact, she, she went to the Portland School of Art and she's a, a brilliant artist, and she's got a lot of very active, active, you know, ideas. But there's no one pulling for that for our side, and I don't understand why. I really, truly do not get that. And the astrology of it doesn't really explain it. I mean, we've got a Jupiter-Pluto-Saturn conjunction, and it's been going on for um, about a year, and it's going to carry on now for another several months. And, you know, that, if anything, is to me a very revolutionary aspect. If you got Jupiter with Pluto and then Saturn, is that there's got to be some kind of backlash um, to the, the, you know, to this governmental situation. And I, too, am a Canadian. So, you know, um, there's got to be something happen. So I'm very curious what will happen in November with the, this election. Very curious. Because I think it all has something to do with this, what's, what's going on just collectively in the United States and, and in other parts of the world. But the other parts of the world, they just hate the guy. But in the United States, we're actually affected. You know, we can introject the collective unconscious. And that's something that Carl Jung was very, very adamant about is never, ever interject the collective unconscious or you'll get sick. And so that's what I... I'm taking away from what you were talking about. Thank and you. I really thank you for saying that too. And I guess what I was talking about in terms of each person kind of finding their own internal structure or what's pulling them forward, I think that's right. really relevant when it comes to people knowing where to position themselves actively out in the world. Because something that I've witnessed from a lot of people is that they either don't know where to align themselves because it's so, they, they don't want to be in the violence or um, yeah. they feel maybe disenfranchised by the black and white myth, which is very interesting because of the Aquarius piece. So people aren't wanting to be black. 
inside, right? And, and I think that a lot of people are confused. It's like they're either not um, radical enough or they're too radical. There's just so many extremes and polarities. And I think it, it will be very interesting when people are able to insert themselves in a more neutral way, um, but still do something, not just necessarily talking about it. I know. I'm, that's what I'm so curious about, Nira, and as you because you're you're right at the age where I was when I was you know really starting to kind of settle down with children and you know because once I had my babies I I just you know that was it that was my became part of my life was to have my family which didn't disconnect me from my friendships and my activities but they became number one um, but. At this time, I wonder, you know, where are you? You know, where where are you all, you kids, you know, young people? Um, well, well, may I, I'd like to actually address that because okay. um, there are a lot of social differences. I'm, I'm 66. I was part of the hippie thing, the, the tail end of it. And uh, what right. I think we're missing here is that um, the 60s were lush financial times. You could coast. Oh, you I could know. A lot of stuff. The kids nowadays um, are barely, they're living at home. They're barely making a living, a lot of them. Exactly. So it's very hard to be socially involved when you got to feed yourself. The other thing, too, is we have um, basically from Reagan on a continual brainwashing via MTV, via the Internet, via social media, that we all want to be famous. We all want to be rich. We all can be special. And uh, I think this Aquarian wave that's going to be coming up, with Saturn and, and Jupiter and stuff, we'll be waking them up. There are plenty of people out there doing social stuff, not to the extent, but we were the baby boom. The, anything we did was going to be overwhelming regardless. If we'd all become, you know, Wall Street people, Wall Street would have collapsed much earlier. So <laughs> it's a, the size of the generation is big. And I think there are mixed messages because there is so much fake propaganda out there twisting everybody in every different direction. And they're doing the same thing now. The FBI and political groups are invading protests and starting riots, just like they did in the 60s under Hoover. It's the same playbook. But we don't have the majority of teenagers working together because there aren't the majority of teenagers anymore. The baby boom is over. So it's going to have to be more. What was that? Oh, I'm sorry, Anthony. I just go right ahead, Mitchell. The baby uh, isn't over. We're still standing. We are. <laughs> I'm talking about the teenagers and the 20 people. The people you're talking about, the younger people okay. now. Okay. But so An Anthony, know. Anthony, yes. the 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 internet, as yes. we know, is a mixed blessing. Yes. It's the greatest thing that that ever was, and it's the worst thing that ever was, which is like very everything. Often the case, like right? everything. With all inventions, right? The automobile is great. It can take you from one place to the other, but the telephone was terrific, but it took away privacy. And the internet is doing the same thing. How we use these inventions, these Uranian, Aquarian inventions, that's going to be the difference. And if Zuckerberg and people like that continue to have the power of the individual over the collective, we're screwed. If yeah. we can regain and demand the, the kind of changes and the kind of equality that we're having a hard enough time with the rest of humanity dealing with, especially financial. I, look, you know, you said it before I had a chance to. Reagan, Reaganomics. That was the beginning of the end of liberalism in this country, in the yeah. whole world, basically. And there's a new book out, I don't have the name in front of me, but I'll, I'll uh, email it to you later, uh, on Reagan and, his, and, and how he created you know, oh, the modern world. Oh, wow, okay. So, so you know, if, if we use the internet, not for QAnon, not for any individual or theorist, whatever, but for, for absolute open conversation, right. we have a shot. Now, I'm not a Pollyanna. I don't think it's all going to be wonderful, and I don't think it's going to be easy. And I, and I think, as I just wrote here, that we're going through our Pluto return, but not just that. We're going through Pluto's Saturn to jump, and America's going through the Pluto return. Right. Pluto needs to eliminate waste, like I said before. So you need to prune the garden before there's new growth, and that's what's happening now. Well, let me, I'd like to comment like to, on yeah, that. I'd like oh, to I'm comment. sorry. Wait, wait. Oh, no, you go ahead, Marie. Now, now, in my opinion, the younger generation that is, you know, of course, of age now, I have a lot of hope for them. And 
you know, the, the agenda that the Pluto and Leo generation had, the whole reason for the Pluto and Leo generation was really about individuation and finding out, and I'm not of that generation. However, you know, when you look at Leo um, esoterically, it's really about in individuating from the past. The younger generation don't really have to so much worry or be concerned with individuation because I believe they came in that way. And I believe that they, you know, yes, there's been a lot of issues that the younger generation has, but I also believe in what I've seen is that they have watched closely what our generation, the Pluto and Virgo generation, or the Leo generation, what we have done. And I think some of them have extracted the good from the, the previous generations and are using it and will use it, but more than not, they have their own way of doing things. And of course, we know that the different the generations after the Pluto and Leo generation aren't as large. So they have a different agenda. They know how they're working on figuring out how they're actually going to implement their plan because they are the leaders that are coming up. And yeah. what we have to do is be a support and help the next generation with their grounding, help them find their footing so that they can shine and do what it is they need to do. Um, no generation is bad. No generation has all the answers. Each generation builds on the previous generation. And so it's, it's, it's time. I mean, so when I say, so when you say why they aren't there, I believe they are there. I believe some are becoming more vocal. Some are working on finding their voice. And I believe that it's our job to help them find their voice and to just be there as a support for the, the generations that came after us. Thank you, Marie. That was wonderful to say. Do that effect just to speak up for that generation because I am part of the one that you guys are all talking about, uh, Pluto and Scorpio. I'm right there with you, Nura. Um, you know, uh, our experience in life is going to be very different. Um, if you think about, you know, the the Pluto Scorpio energy, like as a whole, it's 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 very internal. Scorpio, like it hides, but it waits in the wings. And I think that we will come of age later in life. Um, a lot of that I think has to do with global economy stuff as well. But if you look at the founding fathers of the United States, I mean, I know that we've got worldwide viewers, but Pluto return, big deal. It's just a ton going on. And, and where the U.S. goes, the rest of the world kind of does at this point. Um, our founding fathers, um, that Pluto in um, Ver, uh, Libra generation is starting to enter politics now in our country. And I think that that is going to be really interesting if we consider all of the writing that they did, all of the like Hamilton and, and, and Burr and Washington, they wrote volumes and volumes and volumes of stuff and they, they made their change um, intellectually almost. And I think it's that Libra, you know, need to debate and balance things out. That generation is about to come into political power, so to speak. So I think that we as the, the Scorpio generation will support that later on, but I think that we are kind of coming into this rebirth. Um, we also have a lot more fear than, than the hippie generations that were out there screaming and yelling and I'm mad as hell and I'm not gonna take it anymore. Um, fear of, of arrest and permanent records. And I, that's, it's very, very different now. You know, I mean, we were, we're told through our entire lives, you can't get in trouble, you won't get a job. You know, you can't, that's and the other thing. So we were kind of for, boxed into this kind of uh, complacency. But to my final point, and I promise I'll stop, um, with those, the, the writers and the, you know, what our founding fathers did, we are doing some of that. We're doing that not necessarily on papers and 
but we're doing that online. We're, we're, we're blogging, we're doing stuff behind the scenes. It's not so much in your face as the Leo energy, um, but I think that it's there. It's just powerful, much like Scorpio energy is. It's slow and steady wins the race, and then it just kind of comes at you. And I'm going to stop there. Well, that was okay. Tough. Okay. Thank you. I've, I've waited patiently, and I'm not very patient. So, Eric, you're uh, that's great. <laughs> What I wanted to say it speaks to a deeper issue, which is I think it's time as, hu as humans to stop thinking that having power over is a good idea. I think this is part of the Saturn-Pluto conjunction, which is to look at the basic structure of our world in which hierarchies are more important than, actual in, than actually community. So I, as a person with five planets in Aquarius, Oh, I, I, I kind of resist the whole notion of large groups. I tend to think that from a Uranian point of view, what we're seeking is community in which all people are respected no matter you know, where, they, where they sit in terms of their personal philosophy or how they want to live their life. But we should all have the space in place to live our lives in whatever way is meaningful to us. And I, and I also really... Um, I, I worked a lot with the I Ching many moons ago, and one of the things that really stuck out to me is that you cannot change the world unless you're prepared to change yourself. Well, the I Ching says perseverance th furthers. Yes. Yeah. And, and so, you know, <laughs> we do a great service during this period of time if we are engaged in our, in our, in our inner selves and in recognizing you know, what have we accumulated in our lives, both emotionally, physically, and every other way that no longer serves us? As you can tell, I have Saturn and Virgo. Um, Poor thing. So I, and, and you know what? I'm the eternal optimist. I have a Moon-Jupiter conjunction in Aquarius. I kind of always think that no matter what, he, the human spirit will rise up in support of itself and of others. And I know that we live in a world where there's lots of examples of that not in quotes being true, but I guess I have ultimate faith in human beings and, and maybe I shouldn't, I don't know. Uh, I, 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 you know. I think we spend a lot of time trying to figure out what's gonna happen next. And if anything, this period of time has told us that we really, we just don't know, we can do our best guess but the most important thing is that we build ourselves from the inside out. So no matter what happens, as Maria has talked about, we know we can trust ourselves. Um, Aaron, we have um, a comment from uh, an audience member. Go ahead, Aaron. Okay. That'd be great. Thank and you. Go ahead. Andrea. I'm, I'm, a terrible multi, I'm a terrible multitasker, truth be told. <laughs> well, Andrea, I see you. Oh, yeah, <clears throat> I'm here. <clears throat> and yeah, there you go. Yeah, so basically just a lot going on. I'm an astrologer and I have a niche in sports astrology and I'm watching the A's playoff and they're not doing too <laughs> well, but uh, I digress. And uh, oh. I'm also trying to, um, <clears throat> I, you know, in staying on topic, I, I'm an astrologer and I'm used to working at home, so I'm not quite as freaked out about all the goings on, although they are taking their toll. Unfortunately, I have to schedule um, a dental implant um, surgery during this very hectic time. And of course, phone is ringing. So what should I do? <laughs> Can you hold on a minute, please? No. Hello? Hi, can I call you back? Okay, thanks. Bye. Okay, so when it rains, it pours. So basically, four planets in Virgo, and I'm trying to micromanage and pick the best date. Um, and apparently, you want to avoid the moon in Capricorn for things having to do with teeth. I'm open for suggestions. <laughs> And the dentist wants to do some sort of an uh, impression. And it looks like that would be January 
Um, I have it right here, January 11th, a CT scan and a surgical guide. And then I have to wait two weeks for it to come back to the lab. And then that puts me around the 25th or 26th of January. And then there's a full moon on the 28th. So what astrologer hasn't learned to avoid <laughs> surgery near or on the full moon? And then on the 30th of January, just for fun, we run into Mercury retrograde. <laughs> So what's a micromanaging control freak Virgo astrologer to do? Don't know. <laughs> yeah, Sorry. it just, you know, I didn't really plan on this happening. I sort of had an idea during the pandemic, this was not the best timing to do this. But you know how dentists are, they're like, oh no, you know, you need it extracted, there's decay, you know, they just kind of scare you. Andrea, and, uh, you it worked. So, and, Yes. Can, I, can I answer this for you, Andrew? Yes, please. Uh, first of all, some of the ancient astrological work, having, especially having to do with medical stuff, has to do with the times they lived in. We don't put leeches on you anymore, for the most part. We don't bleed you. No. Many of these, the, one, of the, one of the old adages is you do not have an operation when the moon is in the part is in the sign that rules that part of the body. That's because they were frightened of bleeding. If you are having any kind of procedure done in a modern hospital or dentist's office or something else, you're not gonna bleed out the way that you would have in the 15th century. So you have to upgrade astrology. It's one of the things that, that many astrologers, and I have no problem with things like Operation Look Back and astrologers who wanna do, you know, uh, 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 Hellenistic astrology, it's fine, you study it. But that's not where we live. We live in a modern society. Very often an aspect will simply imply that's what the problem is. Oh, I'm going through serious Saturn issues, I shouldn't have my teeth done. You're going through serious Saturn issues, so you have a problem with your teeth. Of course you should have it done. Now, I also believe in picking a day where the moon isn't void, of course, and Uranus isn't squaring, you know, and Neptune isn't squaring the Mercury. And of course, I do all of that for my clients. But to say I'm not going to have an operation because the astrology says such and such, that's nonsense. I got an emergency call from one of my clients, my student client, her husband. This woman was in the emergency room. She had to have her gallbladder removed. And it was a void of course moon. And she's one of my students and she knew you should not do something like that on a void of course moon. What should she do? I said, the first thing you should do is ask the doctor when the next time is that she could possibly have it. So they said it would be six weeks. And she was in terrible pain. I said, have the damn operation, you'll be fine. They do five of these a day. It's not a big deal. She had it, she was fine, done. Would I have picked that particular day if I had an open calendar, maybe not. But use astrology as a tool. Don't let it use you. Don't, don't do what a lot of astrology students do. My, my, my sister-in-law, my late sister-in-law sent me, gave me this little book called You're Not a Person, Just a Sun Sign or Just an Astrology Chart or whatever. And there's this one little cartoon where the girl's laying on the bed. She goes, oh, woe is me. Why am I always so unhappy? And then the next thing says, and whatever her name is, Linda discovered astrology. And you see the next, you know, caption, oh, woe is me, why was I born with Neptune on the ascendant? You can find an excuse in astrology or you can use it as a tool properly. You have a problem with your teeth, get it fixed. Obviously make sure the dentist knows what they're doing, <laughs> you know, but you can't, you can't. You, you pick and choose when you have the option to do it. I think we all that we know that that's really an important point. And I don't think I don't think a lot of astrologers do know that, Erin. Uh, but that's okay. I mean, oh. I, you know, I think maybe everybody here does, but I know a great many astrologers. I have to I have to teach this to. Well, I, okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Marie. Marie, unmute. Okay, basically I only have a final comment. Um, 
about what we need to do for ourselves, uh, no matter you know what we're dealing with. We must deal with self-care. Um, I mean, and so whatever self-care is or looks like for each of us, we need to actually take care of it, do it. If it means just taking a hot bath or shower or cooking yourself a good meal, because what we're dealing with in this particular time, uh, we're having to deal with all the stressors and the stressors that we're dealing with can cause us to get sick. And we will actually precipitate us getting sick. So my final comment is we need to make sure we know what we need for ourselves to help ourselves stay balanced and stay on track. That's it. Thank you. So Erin, how about we go around and just ask all the speakers to make a final, very short comment. So anyone? Or, we, or have we come to the end? I can say one thing. Um, sure. In all of this, you know, information, I think clarity is really important. And I think that a big piece of, you know, finding stillness, if you don't know what that is for you, um, you know, in, in a lot of the Taoist philosophy, they say, you know, if you're, you know, moving around and making it mucky all around you while you're standing in a pond, you're not going to see what it is that you're doing or what options you have. So I think that right now we can actually benefit a lot from this stillness, especially during this Mars retrograde and Aries mm -hmm. time, while we're still figuring out what we want and, and what we're going to do next. So I just want to you know, give anybody who's unsure the permission that it's okay to kind of be watching and waiting and, and observing and being still. Oh, thank you so much, Nora. I mean, I think it's very important as well, you know, to give permission to, to feel unsettled and, and just sort of spaced out and watch your television programs and so on. I think it's, it's perfectly healthy. In fact, it can keep a person sane, you know. Um, you know, just playing, playing with their mind, playing with their tools that they've got to hand. But it's been a very interesting conversation we've been having here today. I'm, I'm quite, you know, enjoyed it very much. Still am. If there's anybody else that has something they want to throw in at the end, that would be great. Well, I just wanted to say thank you. It's been really lovely to connect with uh, astrologers I've never connected with before and to listen to everybody's thoughts and ideas because, hey, I have seven planets and air signs. There are not enough thoughts and ideas on the planet there. Yeah, anyway, uh, thanks again. And uh, uh, I'm gonna reach out uh, on Facebook to the people I'm not already friends with and hope that you accept my friend request. Okay, I'd be glad to if you're not already on me. I don't know if I am, Erin, I'll have to check it out. Check out my Facebook page. It's interesting. I will. I've got two, my professional one, which is good. Thank you, you people. You've been a wonderful panel, wonderful panel. Thank you so much. What do you think, Linda? Thank you.